Anybody can guess what chapter we're in? <laughs> we are still on the sixth church. Anybody know what the sixth church name is? Lily, do you know what the sixth church in Revelation chapter 3 is? No. Man. Okay. Well, it's not Laodicea. That's the last one that we'll be approaching. But um, go to verse 7, chapter 3. We'll just, we always read this, then we'll get in the notes again. But it's to, the, uh, it's to Philadelphia. And it's the sixth church of the book of Revelation. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jew and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith on the churches. Father, we need uh, some liberty, some clarity, and help us understand some of this book. In Jesus' name, amen. So we, uh, we uh, went through, it looked like approximately two pages already on this very uh, church, uh, historical application and, and the uh, different events that have taken place there. And... Um, This was uh, no doubt uh, we covered uh, what the Apostle Paul encountered in Galatia, and to the uh, and and the epistle is about that too. If you ever go, I think we went to Galatians chapter two to show you that that there were some there. Um, not only the Roman Catholic Church, but such like, uh, but those uh, but those nuts that claim they're the 144,000 Jewish virgin males of Revelation seven. Uh, have tried to convince many they are the real church too. That's the Jehovah false witnesses. So there's always been people trying to prove that they are the true church. Uh, listen, the day of accounting will come. Such false apostles and deceitful workers will present themselves as righteous, but their end shall be according to their works. Go to Second uh, Corinthians chapter 11, Second Corinthians chapter 11. Talking about this sixth church, and uh, there's a group in there that claimed to be something they weren't. And in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, let's see, verses uh, <clears throat> 13 to 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no wonder... For Satan himself is transformed into a what? Angel of light. See, a lot of people think he was an angel, but he's a, he was a cherub. Isn't that right, Jeff? But he can turn himself into that. See, and so that's why they get confused sometimes, these people that uh, call people that believe in the gap heretics and all that. They try to put them in a line. They, I don't know why they miss that. I mean, he's the covering cherub. But anyway, our Bible tells you a little bit about him, what he can do. And uh, he can change himself into an angel light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of what? Righteousness, whose end shall be according to what? Their works. Their works. That's sort of scary, I would think, uh, what the power that he has. Now, our Lord called these people tares in the Gospels, T-A-R-E-S. 
And um, yes, we have time. Matthew 13. I'll, if you had a, um, I don't know, if you got a harmony of Gospels, it's probably in other Gospels too. But in Matthew chapter 13, and let's see, verse 24 to 30. Is the tares. It's a parable. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came in and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Do you see that? But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath these tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also what? The wheat with them. So let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. Right? But gather the wheat into my barn. Boy, what a, what a heavenly story with an earthly application. He didn't tell them to pull the tares up. Because you can't hardly tell them apart. He didn't want the other people to get hurt. So there's a lot of people that will come in and try to destroy the church. And it's been, all, it's been that way. We'll see here. It's been going on ever since Jesus made this little uh, declaration here to warn people that this is going to happen. And if you remember, the good man was asleep when he sold him. So it's not like you can stop everybody and every bad thing coming in. Uh, because if you're in the work of God, if you're saved, uh, there's going to be enemies. And sometimes they have masks or they, have, they put on this face uh, of righteousness and, and they draw people to themselves and they, people just conclude, well, if they're doing this right and that right, they must be okay. And uh, God says they're not. And the only way that anybody in the past, even Martin Luther, and every, we, that we could judge people is by the Scripture. So naturally, if you sow seed in the Scripture... And in the different translations that they have on the market, gradually there'll be no evidence to see who is bad or good. That's why we're sticklers with our King James Bible. We believe God gives us an absolute authority. And so, like I said Sunday a little bit, so if people go to church just for the temporal, they're messing up their eternal rewards. That's what they're doing. So a lot of people are doing that today, though. They're giving up the authority, absolute authority of the Word of God. And they're going with the thoughts of truth. In other words, if you just mention, yeah, the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, 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 we believe that. And, uh, you know, virgin birth, yeah, we believe that. You know, and they'll say all that. And you go to your Bible and some of these doctrines are missing. And then later on you find out that they have no final authority. They go by the original languages that they never saw. And they're critical when they come to them. In other words, they make their own interpretations, and that's how they teach it. Where we as Bible believers believe God had the best there ever was to translate it, and we have the best English translation. And they'll say, well, see, it's even a translation. Yeah, but it's the translation in English. And it substantiates and backs up everything that we teach and we believe. So if I go to court and they put me on the stand... I do not have to speak Hebrew and Greek. Like these people are going to find out they're going to have to. But I can go to my good old English Bible and say, well, where, sir, where is that in your Bible? Because it's not in mine. And I can go over and show them English. But these birds that think they're so smart, the government's going to get them in there one day and going to have their experts there, their Hebrew and Greek experts, you know. And these guys are going to have to talk fluent Greek or Hebrew or they're not going to pass mustard. And they're going to be messed up. I ain't got to do that. See, I'm not even going to claim to do that. I just got me a King James Bible, Scripture with Scripture. And uh, works pretty good for me. And has worked for everybody since then. But I just want you to know that uh, this business of the tares, 
And this business of this uh, this uh, sixth church, which has got the greatest commendation and has done the most work in history, uh, has this problem. Paul spoke about it uh, with the uh, Galatians, trying to bring mix the law of Moses with uh, grace, and and Jesus mentioned it in the Gospels. And Paul declared, go to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians. Apostle Paul declares something. Just so you see these things. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I'll show you some verses here tonight, at least to show you what we're up against a little bit. Now, if you remember First and Second Thessalonians, Paul is giving instruction about the rapture. He's talking about end times. He's talking about us not going to sleep. We're not of the dark. We're of the light. Being aware of what's going on. And, and here in verse 7, this is what he tells the church there. He says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. What are you talking about? God's keeping a lot of that back right now. God is keeping that spirit of iniquity just sweeping the world. The Antichrist. Son of perdition. He's, he's slowing it down so far because we're not raptured out yet. But looks to me like way back then, Paul is already warning you about that. And if you go to 1 John, go to 1 John. Back your Bible there. 1 John, let's see, chapter 2. I just want you to see, because if you look at the dates of the books, for instance, this 1 John was written after A.D. 90, Okay. Like Revelations was written, what do we say, around 96 A.D. So, I mean, this is a long time ago this stuff's been written. So he's telling them, he's, Paul's warning them that there's a spirit of iniquity. There's no doubt about it. But God's not letting it rule the entire world yet, overpowering it yet. He's not allowing that yet. That was back in Paul's day. And here, in, if you have First John chapter 2, look at uh, verse 18. He says, little children, it is the last time as ye have heard that what? Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many what? Antichrist, whereby we know that it is the last time. Wow. And look at verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. What in the world does that mean? What do you think it means? They were associated with them. And the people that they were associating with, John, the other apostles, and the, the, the believers that were there, were full of the Holy Ghost. They were doing what they were supposed to do. And these people couldn't compete with that. All right? And after a while, because there were smaller groups, they could see who was what. And they left. Because apparently they were always trying to stir up something in the midst. See, they were anti-Christ. So they were probably always generating questions. Well, you say he's the Messiah, but now nah, you know better than that. The Messiah would have blah, 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 blah. You know, because that's anti-Christ, see? You know, Jesus is the Messiah. And um, so I'm just showing you that because it's nothing new. It's nothing new. And the devil knows since probably the, I don't know, probably I would even say around World War I, he started dummying down Americans. He really had. Americans got overconfident. They figured they'd always believe certain things like the Bible's the Word of God and and, you know, and you let these creeps, because we're going to look at this too. You had the tares sneak in, right? You got the Antichrist. You got the spirit of iniquity already working. 
this world right here is little g, God, right? The devil was given responsibility for this thing for right now. And uh, that's dangerous stuff when you think about how powerful he is. And he knew he just couldn't overcome us. Because God, you see, had to keep him bound and back from controlling America for a long time. And whether or not it was because Israel was building up and knew that Israel in 1948 was going to be in it, because he is God, right? He knew how all these things was ta- uh, playing out. But still, us as a people, when we started rejecting him and started giving in and giving over to all that European rationalism and all this educated junk that was going against the Bible, when we started allowing that to seep in, see, he was the, the seeds were sown. And so all we're seeing now is, who knows how many generations have had this thing sown in them. And now Christians today claim to be saved, will not talk to you about doctrine. And uh, they won't. There's a minority that does that. They're called Bible believers. Or some used to be fundamental Baptist or fundamentalist. They would argue certain doctrines with you because that was all the kids uh, were brought up like that. Now the new churches... They can have, uh, and what I'm saying right now, I'm not against it, okay? I'm just saying they don't have scripture memorization. So for me to say they have face tattooing, they have uh, lollipops, they have whatever they do. Whatever they give out to get all the kids in and show them that they love them. They give them Bible stories with no memorization of scripture. So the kids are actually hearing what? Paraphrase. Now, we do that here, but we were supposed to have some memorization scriptures. I, don't, I haven't been a good overseer because I haven't really been checking. And I know that we got good Sunday school material. I know stuff is taught. But the little kids are supposed to have a verse. See, they're supposed to know the verse. Parents are supposed to instruct them in the verses. Why? Because once it's in there, it's not getting out. You see? They think they forgot about it. But it's in there. Because, why? Because we believe the Word of God is powerful. Not the thoughts, the words. Because that's what He guaranteed to preserve and empower. So, when you have people coming in like this and you're looking at these generations of these huge churches, and we, we as Baptists and, and, and stuff are seeing where we lack in our area. You know, with certain things that we should be doing. We should have vacation Bible school here. Never had. Should have. There's a whole lot of stuff I feel bad about. And I'm not excusing it. But I am saying, I know you're getting the Bible. I know the kids in Sunday school are supposed to be getting their Bible. I mean, that's one thing I overemphasize. Because when it comes right down to it, you're going to have to give an account of the words. Not thoughts. Now, the Sunday school teachers, preachers, and everything, they'll have to give an account of what they delivered. But that's what you're seeing out there. That's why they're like anemic. And that's why these same people, and what they're not, they're not seeing, the same people that complain about us with our doctrine and believe we have an absolute authority, they will be on the enemy's side when it comes down. They are already leaning, leaning and supporting with their emotions. The gay liberation movement. Immigration of what's going on now. Emotionally. No verses, but emotionally because Jesus loves, right? And you'll get to get into that. And I ain't talking about the hate thing. I'm talking about verses. In other words, why don't you do it? Chapter and verse. Well, we, I just don't think it's right. Now, that's the adults. Why don't you think it's right? Well, I don't think Jesus likes that. Well, where does it say that? In the Bible. Where at? Uh, uh, okay. And uh, anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Anyway, that's what's going on, though. And, and, and really think it through. If, you're, if, if, if they come in and take you, does your kids have any Bible in them? I 
Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And I thought. So if the parents don't give a rip about the scriptures, the kids are not going to give a rip. At least if the parents do and the kids forgot later on, they'll, they'll find out who is right. But the thing that's going to keep you sane is going to be the word of God. I got an amen. Wow. Teaching, I got an amen. Fantastic. Anyway, did you see that then? In 1 John 2.18, you saw that, right? Okay, just so you see that now. And um, also, go to Jude. I would tell you chapter, but then you get confused. Because they used to do it before just to see who would keep looking for the chapter and it wasn't there. They, they could tell you never read your Bible. Right? If I told you to go to Jude chapter 2, you'd still be looking, wouldn't you? Okay. Now, look at verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the what? Faith which was once delivered unto the saints. What's that? That's scriptures. And back when he was writing this, what was it? Old Testament? Sure. Contend. You know what that means, right? It means to fight. But we're not going to use that right now. We're going to go to verse 4. Verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares, you see that unawares? Not underwear, unawares. And remember the tares, how they were sown? And remember Antichrist? Just remember the verses that we just covered. So this is nothing new. I'm just telling you, it's nothing new. Who were before of old ordained to the condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, Right? And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we call them and how often have I preached messages on them? Creeps. Creeps in the church. <laughs> but you look at this and, and you got to think it through. you got to say, well, my goodness. If you don't see it already happening. I'm, I'm talking, really people, I'm not talking just Catholic Church. Everybody out there says, why should we get people upset? With Jesus, the name Jesus. We believe in God. They believe in God. What's the problem here? Why can't we get together on this? Jesus would have wanted everybody to get together. He would have made such a fuss about his name. I'm telling you. And they're going to go to the Bible. And somebody's going to look for First Timothy 4. They're going to look for Acts. They're going to look for all these things that said there's no other name under heaven. Whereby men might you know, be saved. You know, the name of Jesus Christ. You know, they're going to go everywhere and it's not going to be there because the translation that they're going to be using, they conveniently are going to take this out. Oh, they wouldn't do that. They're already doing it. And people don't care. People don't care. You can sit down with somebody, and I'm telling you what, and they love the Lord. I'm serious. I talk, they love the Lord, they witness, uh, they got more compassion they got more, than I do. Right? And I simply ask them, why do you still use the new international version? I see nothing wrong with it. And I tell them 64,000 changes. And I go through the main doctrinal verses. And it still does not bother them that they're gone. That's what I'm talking about. There's something wrong there. Because that means they don't emphasize them doctrines. People growing up in the church are not getting that proper teaching and doctrine. And we're seeing it today, all through there. Listen. This is what will come down. They're going to point the finger at you, right? You, you're you not like your preacher, but I mean, if, if they say, well... Brother Bob, you're, you're just really cold. You're still too cold. I know it. Would you pray for me? 
That's what I tell them. Or Brother Bob, you're this or that. Yep, you got that right. So then I go before the Lord Jesus Christ, and they do too. There's a lot of things I'll answer for judgment seat of Christ. But me not taking God at his word, that ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. So you see, I'll agree with them when they, when they get me on that, but they're not going to get me on the word of God. And I'm going to turn it around on them and ask them what they're going to do when they go before Lord Jesus Christ and answer for all those verses that he told them to keep his words. And all the promises that surrounded preservation, inspiration of his word. They don't have that. So we'll just have to see how it comes out of the judgment seat of Christ. If they're saved, because that's dangerous too. Okay. Now you say, well, what's going on with these people, these creeps and everything? Go to Galatians chapter 1. You can tell a lot of these people because what they'll do is they love the book of Galatians to show you that if you have any standards, you're a legalist. You're a Pharisee. They don't even know what a Pharisee is. (laughs) What they ought to say is, you're a Pharisee that's gone wrong. Because there was nothing wrong with Pharisees. But they tried to turn it into a bad word. And they don't even have enough Bible. Except your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisee. Our Lord and Savior said that. Somebody set up the Pharisees. You know what they were? To guard the Scriptures. Pharisees were like the Bible believers are today. Except their problem was they allowed their position and arrogance to rule in their life. And they didn't do what they were supposed to do. So many people have went to those scriptures to try to disprove tithing, to disprove that. And they don't even read the scriptures. If they read them just to, if they had them, I guess. You in Galatians chapter 1. This is all about this church. All about these group, this group of synagogue of Satan that was in this fantastic church that kept the Word of God and prophetically speaking from those years all the way to the 1500s, all the good that was done in this era. But in Galatians chapter 1, and uh, we'll read in verse, we'll read uh, 6 to 9. I marvel that ye are so, or, or I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto a what? Another gospel. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Which is not another. What was it talking about? What was it talking about? Think about what he just said. They're trying to profess another gospel, another way. Paul's saying... It's Jesus Christ, right? His death, burial, and resurrection, that is the gospel. They are trying to bring another gospel in. Every time a person says that you've got to not only believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but you've got to speak in tongues, and when they start adding things to the gospel, that is legalism. You don't have to do nothing. No works at all to be saved. And you don't have to do nothing to stay saved. But saying that doesn't remove standards or convictions. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got to do if you make somebody, if you make that gospel conditional, then you got a problem. Then it's another gospel. If we were to look around, there's a whole lot of people preaching another gospel. Claim to be Christian. But you can lose it. Evidence has to be speaking in tongues in some of them. I mean, you got snake handlers. There's so many things out there going on that you got to do this, you got to do that, or you're not this and you're not that. It's got nothing to do. But that's what was going on in Galatia. I wanted you to see there was another gospel. Another gospel. Now, they are in all appearances, if you look at them sometimes, good men, 
righteous men, but they go around trying to establish their own righteousness, which is not God's righteousness. Romans 10.3 tells you that. Now, the day of God's vengeance is not yet. It's not yet. You find that in Isaiah. Uh, go to Isaiah 61. I've got to hit some of these verses. Preacher, how do you get all that in the book of Revelation? I'm telling you. Some in it. Because the book of Revelation generates a whole lot of questions. <laughs> so there's a whole lot of questions that need to have an answer. You got that? I, I, uh, over there in Isaiah 61. We're talking about the day of vengeance is not yet. Okay, look at verse 2. This is our Lord Jesus Christ. He says to, proc to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of what? Vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Now, don't you find that amazing that Jesus Christ quoted Isaiah 61 and he stopped at the semicolon in the Gospels? No way. Well, let's just read the first part. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Who did that? Jesus did that. Did Jesus do the other part yet after the semicolon? No way, Jose. There ain't no vengeance yet. That's why he didn't quote that. Go, go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, and if you remember when he went to Nazareth and he's speaking there in the synagogue, okay, let's begin reading in verse 18 to 20. The Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he's speaking, reading that place out of the book. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor, he hath set me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And what did he do in verse 20? And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture, what? Fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of the mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? See, when you read Isaiah, what's so important about that? There's a semicolon in the translation. There's no semicolons in the originals. There's no chapter or verse references either. So that semicolon separates a couple thousand years. Jesus just happened to read in the book and stopped right there and didn't go any further. You see, in the book that he was reading the scriptures, there was no punctuation. But he stopped there. When you go messing with this book, even... Even the italics. Beware. People have studied this stuff too much. There is too many coincidental things that has happened with this King James Bible that I wouldn't mess with it. I wouldn't mess with it at all. But at any rate, I'm telling you, it's not the time of vengeance yet. So that's why these spirits and everything's going on and, and being let loose because we're getting down the line of history, getting towards that Jacob's trouble, that tribulation period, and the rapture of the church. It's getting close. And it's good to understand that and to see that it's not vengeance yet. Some people will teach that and get you to have a bomb shelter and the whole shot. Listen, if God's going to bring judgment, if it's the tribulation period, you ain't. They, they have weapons out there you would not believe. 
I mean physically. God would have to be behind a revolution. Besides the satellites, beside all the automatic stuff that they have, he would, his spirit would have to be between, you know, behind this for it to really succeed or it's not going to work. That's our first revolution work. He was behind it. There's just too many coincidences there that happened too. But um, anyway, he's not, <laughs> believe me, God will repay. God will pay back. He will also return, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. And believe me, they'll know how our Lord loved the church and gave himself for it. If you remember Ephesians 5 and verse 25, we use that uh, with the marriage ceremony. Uh, we're the bride of Christ, so there's no way that he didn't like us and love us. And uh, we need to never fear when Satan is found in our midst. Uh, we'll mark them and them, and we'll warn the saints and make it clear the nature of his or her lying ways. That's the other trick of the devil is don't mention any names from the pulpit. Don't do this. Listen, my King James Bible God mentions names, real names. I say God because it's his word. Paul mentioned real names. He told you about a coppersmith that did him wrong. He, you know, Demas hath forsaken me. I mean, there's names in there of wrong people. And if there's somebody, if somebody gets down on Joel Osteen because he doesn't give the clear gospel, if somebody gets down and names these other people, have at it. If they're teaching heresy, they need to be marked. And their comeback will be, it's not heresy. These people are just, they're heretics. And who cares? If you got the book, you got the goods on them. You get rid of this book, you're going to have a mix, mishmatch. You're going to have just some mush out there. And pretty soon you'll be like all the rest trying to get the latest and the newest. And pretty soon you'll be down to a few pages that everybody agrees on. And so you got to beware of this stuff. So when we're looking at this church, uh, this sixth church, what a blessing. And it's, it's interesting that the last church is exactly the way it's, 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 it's going to be, Laodicea, exactly what we're going through now. But I like that spirit, like I told you before, you can go through all the churches, all seven churches, and you can see exactly what God hates in each one of them churches. And if there's something he doesn't like or he hates, if you stop doing that, that helps your character, right? In other words, you want to please God, you don't want to be like this. And it'll help you out. So spiritually, devotionally, you can take these churches and you can use it as an individual. Right? Okay. Um, I know that the Lord is, there's no doubt about it that he's coming back. And uh, a lot of them think they have church, but it's a Satan's church. And uh, after all, here it says it's called the synagogue of Satan. And listen to me, payback will come. They have, uh, they have afflicted the church for centuries. Untold millions have been murdered and millions have been deceived by her and died and went to hell because they believed in what man said. Not what God said, but what man said. Satan and his followers will bow down and acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and his redeemed. His bride will be present there also. No way. Go to Revelations. You right there with three. Let's see what 21 says. What does 321 says? Well, I'm in Luke. I ain't going to help. Okay. 3 and verse 21. Look what it says. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So where he is, we are. You got it? So when the devil's put down, guess what? We get to see that too. I think that's a pretty good deal. I mean, for hell-bound sinners getting saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. So because when they persecuted his beloved, they persecuted him. And how do you know that? Well, we won't go there because of time. But in Acts 9, 1 through 4, that's the testimony of uh, the Apostle Paul. And um, Jesus Christ is, is up in glory, and he's talking to Paul. 
And he's telling him that he persecuted him. Now, if he's up there, how in the world could Paul persecute him? Only way he could persecute him is if he persecuted people down here that belong to him. So what he was telling Paul is, you messed with them, you messed with me. You hurt them, you hurt me. That's a good connection. You read it on your own, Acts 9, 1 through 4, it'll be good for you. And then we know that Satan himself will be bruised, not only under our Lord's feet, but ours as well, Romans 16, 20. Surely we're more than conquerors. All trials will erase when one glimpse of his dear face we see. Amen. There are uh, enemies of Christ. Therefore, we're the enemies too. We will have tribulation now, but triumph later. Our enemies will know that he loves us. Uh, They will know he doesn't let uh, anyone mess with his bride and get away with it. When? Well, it's not going to be yet. And and in in chapter 3 there, as we're reading, uh, this church, verse 10 says this, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. I mean, what a blessing this church receives because of their obedience. Um, They're they're, uh, spared a specific judgment on the whole earth. The phrasing of temptation is important. God said, from the hour the hour, a specific time, and upon the whole world. So this judgment is at a specific time, and the geographical location is the whole earth. That's what that verse is telling you. After all, the book of Revelation sets forth in uh, specific detail this horrible time of God's wrath. Therefore, we conclude this specific deliverance is speaking of that time. Remember, we see this as deliverance from, from, that's pre-tribulation. Not deliverance through the judgment. That's post-tribulation. The church had the rapture taught to them. They were promised deliverance from the time of trouble, which will overtake the world, but not overtake them. Therefore, encouraged to continue to fight the good fight and remain true and faithful to his word. So remember what it said, keep thee. He does the keeping, not us. He'll keep us from that specific hour, time, but not from temptations in the world. All true believers will be taken out before this raft. I'm reading it. Did you understand what I said? Sometimes I don't look up when I'm reading. Just want to make sure you're not falling asleep. The specific wording is, is, is good to look at. And uh, we'll be taken out before this raft. Uh, go to First uh, Thessalonians five. Now, I believe Sunday night we went through and did a little study too, which should dovetail with this Sunday night. If you remember, we did that. First, yeah, First Thessalonians chapter five and verse eight and nine. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now look what it says. For God hath not appointed us to what? Wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? What does it say? Now, if some Bible takes that word raft out of there, they can, they can, I'm telling you, when they start taking certain words out of this book, it's going to change doctrine. And that's what they want to do. And then Romans chapter 5. Go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And you should love these verses. And in verses uh, 8 and 9, it says this, But God committed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now look what it says. Much more than being now what? Justified by his blood, we shall be saved from what? That's what it says, right? Wrath? Okay. Wrath through him. That's why in, in chapter 3, and verse 11, Revelation, it says, Behold, I come quickly. 
when used to the church at Sardis that we read, it was judgment. Here it's a blessing of deliverance. Come quickly. And how quick is quickly? Well, if you went to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you don't have to do that, but mark it on a piece of paper. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 57. A twinkling of an eye, that's pretty quick. Right? That's pretty quick. Amen. Maybe we'll go and we'll do that next time. You say, well, how many pages do we have? I know you don't say that. It's me talking to myself just in case you're thinking. I'm trying to look here, but it looks like I have one. Probably four pages before we get to Laodicea. Amen. Amen.